Hello everybody! In what follows I want to show how to compute variations of the LSE factorization and the LPF array with suffix trees. In detail we look at the following two variations of the Lamplusif 77 or shortly LSE factorization, namely the non-overlapping variation called NOF LZ in this talk or the reversed LZ. We can compute with the longest previous factor array or shortly LPF the LC factorization. And similarly, we can compute um, these two variants with variants of the LPF array called LPNF and LPNRF, where N stands for non-overlapping and R stands for reversed. Our contribution is a 2N bit representation of these two arrays. And we propose new uh, linear time or near linear time algorithms computing the mentioned factorizations or arrays in small space. To explain our approach, we use the following setting, namely that we have given an input text T of n minus one characters, which are drawn from an alphabet sigma, and we denote with small sigma its size, and we append to the input text uh, symbol dollar, which is smaller than all other characters in the alphabet. Here, done there, I've drawn an example for a binary alphabet and its LPF in its two variations, which I explain later. But all of them have in common that they store at the ice position the longest previous occurrence. So you can see that because A and B are the leftmost occurrences of these characters, it's easy to see that uh, they are just zero stored. And if we take one row and go to the left, you can always see that there is an arbitrary increase. But if you look at uh, the decrements, then you can see that the values are always decremented by one. And you can see this smooth decrementation at the end. This property is not limited just to LPF in its variations, but also to, um, you can see that in the PLCP array, where Sadakane gave a 2M bit representation, which we also use. So what is the PLCP array? It stores in the ice entry, um, the longest common prefix of the ice suffix with its lexicographically preceding suffix. First property is that the last entry is always zero because it corresponds to the dollar and there is no dollar in the text. Next property is that because each suffix has a length of at least, uh, at most n, uh, there is no entry that is larger than n. And finally, this property can be understood easily if we look at the right image where we have for the, the value i minus 1, a factor f, and it appears here again when this appearance coincidence with the starting position of the suffix that corresponds to the lexicographically preceding suffix of i minus 1. And in this case, you just remove the first character of f and you get another factor f prime, and it appears on the left hand side in the same way. So you can see that um, the i's entry is at least the previous entry subtracted by one. And if you put the right hand side to the left, you get um, this difference, which is non negative. And if you um, because this is non-negative, you can write it in unary. And if you sum up all these unary values, you get n bits because PLCPN is like above zero. And PLCP of zero, which is used for i equals one, we set it just to zero. So you need n bits, so n ones for the unary values. And you separate each unary value by a zero, and you get two n bits. This representation is not limited to the PLCP array, but also used for matching statistics or the LPF array. 
And on the left hand side, I show the references of the first discovery of this property or the first discovery of this 2n bit representation of the respective array. Interestingly, each array here corresponds also to a factorization, like the LCP comp is a bidirectional compression scheme that uses a PLPF array. Next, we look at um, the computation, and we can see that there are algorithms already computing these two variations, which take linear time or had a dependence on the alphabet, but got improved also to get uh, linear time independent of the alphabet. But most of the algorithms use order of n log n bits, except this one here, but it has a quadratic logarithmic bound on the alphabet. Now we have this 2n bit representation of the output, and therefore this order of n log n bits of working space is no longer optimal. So the question is, can we improve the working space without sacrificing the time too much? Our result is that given an epsilon larger than zero, which is selectable, we have a basic time that is linear. And for each target, we propose two different approaches. And the first one takes um, in space basically an integer array and a fraction of it, plus some compact data structures. And these approaches run all in um, constant multiplicative time penalty to the basic time. So they run basically in, in linear time. The second approach uses space uh, linear to the number of bits of the input, but have a penalty dependent on the suffix array queries where we use a suffix array sampling, which takes order of uh, log sigma n. Um, time. But not notably, for the reverse LZ, we don't use the suffix array sampling. So we get here again constant time. And for the reverse approaches, we need twice the number of bits as for just a non-overlapping variation. So in what follows, we first look at the non-overlapping variation, the NOF-LZ factorization which I first introduced by the, our running example, where we compute the, um, this factorization by scanning the text from left to right and always finding the longest previous non-overlapping factor. So as uh, already seen before, AB does not have any factors before. So we just write down A and B. Now B occurs previously, but not BA. So there is a factor starting at position two of length one. Then there is ABB starting at position one of length three. But if you look closely, there is also ABBA uh, starting here, but it would overlap uh, with our factor and we uh, prohibited factor overlapping. So the longest possible factor has to be length of three and we achieve that here. And then it continues in this fashion. Now, how do we compute this factorization? Like already described in the title of this talk, we use suffix trees. And here is the suffix tree of our running example, where we enumerate the nodes by their pre-order number, and we annotate each leaf by its suffix number in blue underlined. We additionally color in green those leaves uh, whose suffix number corresponds to a factor starting position. And the idea is that we emulate the scan from left to right of the text by taking the leaves in suffix number order. So we start here and with lambda, lambda denotes the current um, leaf we process. And now what we do is that we go from the root down to lambda. And for each node we visit, we check the smallest suffix number in uh, the respective subtrees. And whenever um, this is equal to, um, whenever this, this is smaller than um, the suffix number of lambda, we continue. 
But you can see that um, this sn, is a small suffix number in this subtree of the node 1, which is the root, is 1, which is already the suffix number of, of lambda. So we already terminate. So there is nothing to do. And we continue by uh, setting the next um, factor position uh, at 2. So we know that the next factor set starts at text position 2 and go there. Do the same again and find out that there is nothing to find out because um, you know that at uh, node 9, um, the smallest number is already 2, though we have not found any reference yet. More interestingly is at position 3, where for 9 we get the 2, but 2 is smaller than 3, so we continue. So 9 is the last node we visit. And this tells us that there is a reference, namely the 2. And uh, the length of the factor we have found is um, the string depth of 9, which is 1. But because 1 is just a single character, um, this b, it cannot overlap, and uh, we're done. So more interestingly is then um, the next factor starting at position 4, where we climb down until finding uh, node 6. And the 6 tells us uh, that um, we have found a factor, but we don't use the string depth, which is 5, because this would give us an overlapping factor. Here, we need to take into account the um, reference. So to what do we refer to? And this is um, the text position 1. And the difference between 1 and the suffix number of lambda is uh, 3. So it could be at most uh, 3, the factor lengths. More abstractly, what we did is uh, we traversed downwards until hitting this node V marked in red. And we take the node U, which is V's parent. And what we compute is the factor lengths by determining um, so there's two minimas. So the first one is uh, the suffix number of lambda minus Sn of V. So we take the minima of this difference and the string depth of V. And then we do the same thing for U. And then we take the max of both because either of one is the correct answer. It could be that, for instance, for U, there is another leaf hanging down, which has a much smaller suffix number so also u is shallower than v, which means that the string depth of u can, is, is always smaller than the string depth of v. And there can be a much better reference. And this concludes um, the computation of NOF LZ, where we used n calls to Sn and z calls to string depths. And to compute LPNF, we treat each leaf as a factor starting position and use a suffix links to omit the traversal from the top. So we don't start always at, at the root, but um, use the suffix link to start at an internal node. And this gives us, in total, order of n calls to Sn and string depths. But to actually compute them, we, we need to know um, how much time that uh, these computations take. And that depends on the suffix tree representation. Now, if you use a classic construction like from uh, Martin, then this one takes order of n time, but it already uses n log n bits of working space. So this is prohibitive in our setting. Luckily, there are suffix tree representations that can be even constructed in small space. So the space down there is also the construction space. The first one um, uses this already explained this um, array plus a fraction of it plus um, compact data structures. And the time is basically constant. Um, the second one is a classic uh, compressed suffix tree, which uses uh, bits linear into the bit size of the input, but has this penalty for the suffix array sampling. Alternatively, we can compute string depths in order of the value of string depths, which we actually do in the next step for the reverse LC factorization. So there, we don't use the suffix error sampling. And the reverse LC factorization works very similarly. But the only difference is that we have to match 
the reverse of the factor in the previous part. So this is the same, but now we don't check for BA, but AB appearing before, and this is true. So there is um, AB appearing at position one of length two, but not BAB. There is ABB appearing before, but if you look closely again, there is also BABB appearing at position three, BABB, but it's again overlapping and we don't um, allow overlaps. So this um, BBA is the longest possible factor. And we continue in this fashion. Now we don't use the suffix array of T, but first use the reverse of T, which we denote by TR. And then we build the suffix tree, suffix tree on R, which is T sharp TR dollar, where sharp and dollar are characters with dollar smaller than sharp, smaller than all other characters. And we use the following key lemma, stating that each factor is the string level of a suffix tree node. To see that, let's visualize R in this way. And let's say there is a factor f, and it, after it ends, there is an a. Because this is a factor, um, there has to be a reversed occurrence of it appearing before. And let's say the character preceding this um, reference is a bar, which can be any character except a. If it would be a, then you can extend f to f a. Now, because we have TR on the right hand side of R, there has to be a mirror image of A bar FR, which is F A bar. So, a, uh, so R has the substrings F A and F A bar. So in the suffix tree of R, there is a node with the string level F and it branches there to A and A bar. And we use that fact in the following um, algorithm, which is explained as a cooperative two-player game. So in this game, each player takes turns at the same pace. The player two selects leaves in descending suffix number order. And what she does is she marks all nodes on the pass up to the root. For player one, uh, she selects leaves in ascending suffix number order, so starting at the uh, note with suffix number one. And if she selects a leaf uh, whose suffix number corresponds to a uh, factor starting position, then she searches the lowest marked ancestor of uh, on this pass. And this determines the factor length, which is uh, the string depth of this ancestor. And in this game, player one starts. So we have here the suffix tree of R, and we color again in green the leaves um, that correspond to the factor starting positions. We've already placed the players at the right positions. So this is the leaf with the largest suffix number and this with the smallest suffix number. Player one starts, looks at the markings, but there is, has nothing been marked. So she knows that the uh, next factor starts at text position two, uh, colors it in green and is done, Mark goes to the next uh, leaf and player two takes turn. And what she does, she just colors all um, nodes up to the root. So she does the marking and then she moves to the preceding leaf. Now uh, it's again player one's turn. She looks at uh, the marked nodes, but only the root is marked, so nothing has to be done. She knows that the next factor starts at takes position three, um, goes to the next leaf and is done. So now again, player two, she marks everything and is done. And now for player uh, one, she now finds some interesting marked notes, namely the lowest note that is marked is 20, which uh, is now colored in red. And it tells us that the next factor or the current factor has length two and the next factor that starts at text position five. And the game ends when both uh, players meet at uh, the suffix um, that starts with sharp. So they meet at the leaf um, that corresponds to the suffix. 
because uh, player two just can terminate whenever she visits an already marked node. Um, she visits at most uh, order of n nodes. And player one calls order of c times string depths, where c is a number of factors. And to find the source positions, uh, we need additional c log n bits and run a second game, but keep the red marked nodes. And the idea is that whenever player two now comes to a red marked node, she writes uh, in this um, red marked node the suffix number of the leaf from which she came. And then uh, player one can find out uh, the right uh, reference. And this can be done in uh, our space bounds because C is, or is bounded by order of log sigma n. And you can see that this is uh, in um, n log sigma bits of space. In total, we have a linear time for the reversed LC factorization because if we sum up all these string depths calls, this sums up to n because uh, the sum of all factor lengths is n. Unfortunately, for the LPNRF computation, the best way, I think, is still to use the suffix array sampling so we get this space bound. Uh, this time bound, I mean. Uh, the, the open problem is, can we get rid of the TSA in this time bound? And uh, the interesting thing is that we can do that for the matching statistics, because for the st matching statistics, uh, the referencing part is kind of static, while for all LPF variations, you always have to refer to the uh, already processed part, and this is kind of dynamic, and this makes kind of problems. Another question is whether we can find um, properties like uh, the irreducible ICP values in the LCP array. And uh, the idea is that maybe we can just do the computation for the irreducible uh, ones, while for the reducible ones, we can uh, make use of the previous computations. And if we find this kind of notion in uh, the LPF arrays, then the next question would be, what would be the sum? For the LPF um, array, we know the sum is n log n, a bundle by order of n log n. And finally, uh, there's a lot of been done in the compressed space. For instance, uh, in order of R words of space, where R is in the runs of the borders wheeler transform. So for instance, for matching statistics or the LPF array, there are uh, results known. And we can easily adopt uh, the algorithm of polyclity and Pretzer computing the IC factorization for the NOV IC, because the idea is um, they update the uh, uh, RLBWT of the reverse text while computing a factor. And instead, we can just keep uh, it and update it after determining the respective factor. But uh, adaptation to LPNF is hard because we always need to insert uh, characters and then delete it again and do the same step again and over and over. And this sums up to quadratic a number of steps. So in this setting of order of our words of space, it's still open whether we can do something feasible for LPNF or LPNRF. So this is um, that, and thanks for listening, and any questions are always welcome.